Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the founder of Black Hat, Jeff Moss. Wow. Good morning, everyone. Wow, this is a, a different view than last year. We've grown a bit and we required a bigger room, so this is pretty cool. I can pace the stage, hopefully get you thinking a little bit before I introduce the keynote. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jeff Moss. I'll be your, uh, your keynote introducer. Uh, and I also had the, uh, the luck, the honor of, of producing and starting Black Hat and to see it grow especially in Europe, to this size, it's really humbling. I mean, our industry is not slowing down. If anything, our industry, as we'll be talking about later, we're facing more and more challenges right at the time I think we're able to deal with them. Um, so it's not all doom and gloom. It's just a lot of hard work, you know. Um, so <clears throat> I want to talk to a little bit about the event, and then I want to have some opening uh, comments. And if you've seen me do this before, I like to talk about sort of the diversity of people that attend Black Hat. And it hasn't changed for this year. We have over 106 countries represented in this room. So people came from 106 different countries to hear what's going on here. And um, out of those 106, there's a single person that came from 26 of the countries. So there's 26 countries that only had one person. And I'm always curious. On, on what countries that is. So I have a little list here. I'm just going to go through some of them. Uh, hopefully you find this interesting as well. We have one person from America, Samoa. Azerbaijan. Uh, and if you're that one person while I call us out, feel free to whoop it up or raise your hand or cheer. Um, one from Benin, Cape Verde, Colombia, Ethiopia, Guinea, Honduras, Hong Kong, Iceland, Lebanon, Luxembourg, Monaco, Oman, Peru, Puerto Rico. Here's one that's not really a reunion, technically a French division, but still only one person from the island. We'll give them a pass. Uh, one from Senegal, Sierra Leone, Somalia, Sri Lanka, Sudan, Syria, Thailand, Uzbekistan, and one from Yemen. And I didn't hear one whoop. Maybe there, none of them are here in the room. Um, Something we also try to do to uh, enlarge the pool of people in the InfoSec community uh, and people who get interested or, or try it out is we do scholarships. So Black Hat can be expensive for some that not uh, not working in the field professionally. And so years ago we came up with an idea of these scholarships where you write a white paper, you show us some research, and, and if it meets a certain standard, we give you a free pass. And the idea is to try to bring in continuously uh, new fresh blood. And so this year, there are 120 scholarships were awarded. Um, so it's 120 new people that probably would not have been able to attend. So if any of those 120 are here, can you please raise your hand for a round of applause? Ooh, good job. <laughs> Woo! <clears throat> okay, so if you see those people, feel free to go up and talk to them um, and try to convince them that this is a really good field to be in. <laughs> Not too much pressure or anything. Um, all right, so I like to also just make a couple of observations before we kick off with our keynote. And I've been really thinking about what feels different about this year than last. Because it does feel different to me. And I think part of it is that I feel like we've entered almost a new like era or new stage or some new awareness. And I felt this before a couple of times. One time... Who remembers like the dot-com boom era, leading up to the boom and then the bust, right? I mean, that was a magical era. We realized that value was now at risk. We put everything on the internet. Um, and we did a lot of commerce on the internet, right? That was sort of the dawn of e-commerce. eBay, um, Amazon started, but a lot of commerce. And it was this sort of rush to find security professionals that could protect things online where before Nothing needed protecting. And that empowered us a lot. And it gave us a lot of self-worth, gave us careers. It showed that there was value uh, in this field. And then time went by. And around 2010, 
Um, who remembers when uh, Google came out publicly and said that they had been hacked by the Chinese? Right? That was a big deal. And I feel that was, for me, that was sort of like this epoch moment. There's before Google did that and then after Google did that. Because before that, I would talk to people in uh, policy or leadership and I'd say, well, you have these threats and these governments. And nobody believed you. And then you talk to the IT people and you talk to the managers and they're like, oh yeah, China's all over us. It's a total disaster. They're stealing everything. Then you talk to leadership and they're like, no, everything's fine. Nothing's on fire. Then Google comes out, speaks publicly that this is a problem and it's really happening. And all of a sudden, overnight, it was acceptable to talk about nation states stealing your stuff. I remember companies were actually, I was at this one executive event somewhere and the CEOs were actually bragging to other CEOs. Oh, you have? Have you been broken in by China yet? No? Oh, you must, must not be that important. And it was like they were bragging about how critical and important they were based on who was hacking them. But that enabled us to speak to a new audience. The media took us a little bit more seriously, boards took us more seriously, and leadership took us more seriously. And that was really a before and after event. And now I feel kind of feel like this is happening again. And it's around non-traditional infosec topics. It seems like we're dealing with almost like great power politics have entered our arena. It's not just law enforcement or organized crime or botnets or something. It feels like great powers are now playing in our area, right? Nation states with different agendas and different rules are now playing in our backyard. But it's still our networks. They're on our systems. And the things that are happening are not really traditional. It's not so much stealing money, but it's, it's like election meddling. Um, it's creating fake news narratives. It's deep fakes. It's propaganda. It's us waking up to the risks, social risks, of maybe giant social media platforms. Those, none of these are traditional infosec problems, but we're going to be the ones getting the phone call. We're going to be the ones being asked on how to fix it. We're going to be asked what are the risks. And so we're going to have all of our normal responsibilities, but we're in a new era where we're going to be called upon to really provide advice and try to fix some of these issues. And I think that's super exciting and it's super scary at the same time. Um, but it's definitely not like it was two years ago. Right? There is a general acceptance now that we're in a different era, much like when Google made it acceptable to talk about uh, being attacked and having your intellectual property stolen. Um, the election meddling in the United States has made it okay to talk about uh, uh, interference in electoral processes. And it's also allowed us to talk about the harms that social media platforms like Facebook can potentially enable. So it's a different era. And one of the reasons I'm really optimistic though is as a community, we've been really growing the last 10 years, and we've also really embraced, I think, a certain amount of diversity. I mean, we have a wider pool of candidates than we've ever had, uh, more gender, more ethnicities, more religious uh, views, and these are all super important because if you look at the type of problems we're going to be facing, these are more socially oriented problems. So if you're building a platform for a social uh, pool, you need people from those communities to inform your, uh, your UI, your decisions, train your AI and ML systems, right? So super optimistic, super stressed out, and we're all going to be in this together, which is exciting. Um, and so to help talk about one slice of this um, is our keynote speaker, uh, Marina Caldran. And I really, I think that I've turned to her and, and, and learned a lot from Marina. I want to just tell you a little bit about her bio, and then I want to unleash her on you. Um, so Marina served as the Estonian Foreign Minister in 2015 and 2016, uh, after starting her career in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So she was a, uh, a government employee, or what we call in the States a govy, not a political appointee, but a career uh, government servant. Um, and she was part of the delegation that negotiated the withdrawal of Russian troops um, from Estonia and the Estonian border region. So she's been dealing with um, the Russians for quite a while. 
Um, and uh, in my area, the technology area, it's fascinating. She's served twice as the Estonian representative to the UN group of governmental experts with a focus on telecommunications technology and international security. So that's the tie between the technology and the national security uh, requirements of, of these nation states of the big powers. Uh, and then I've known and worked with Marina since the, she's our chairwoman for the Global Commission on the Civility of Cyberspace, where I serve as a commissioner, but she's our chairwoman, does a fantastic job. And I just learned um, backstage, I didn't realize, she is simultaneously now running for two positions. She's running for the EU parliament, and she's also running for the uh, Estonian national parliament. So if that's the case, if she wins, um, then she can't be our chairwoman, but then she's going to be on to bigger and better things, really trying to take the fight into the government and trying to make things better uh, at a national or European level. So with that, I'm really proud and pleased to introduce uh, Marina. Come on up. <laughs> Did I lay it on too? Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> wow. Good morning, everybody. It's like in the United Nations, not many women in the audience. So I'm happy to bring some gender balance to the Black Hat Conference. Yes, my name is Marina. I'm not an IT person. I do not know how to program. And when I, my son heard that I'm going to chair the Global Commission, he laughed. I consider myself rather being an alien in today's cyber world, if to use the expression of my very good friend, Professor Joseph Nye. I dedicated 25 years of my life and service to the Foreign Service of Estonia. Besides being Foreign Minister, I was Estonia's ambassador to six countries, including Israel, Russia, and the United States. I was in the United Nations, I'm chairing the Global Commission on Stability of Cyberspace, so the logical question is, what am I doing here? The short answer is, Jeff invited. <laughs> and you don't say no to Jeff, he's a nice guy. But seriously, why did I accept the invitation? For the first time I attended Black Hat, it was Black Hat USA 2017. And I listened to the keynote there, which was delivered by Alex Thomas. And among other things, he talked about diversity. He talked about broader perspective and need for bringing people closer to IT community. He talked about social skills and responsibility. And diversity was the key word, which was also mentioned by Jeff when introducing me. I went to many briefings, workshops, even some illegal ones. I can't say that I blended in 100%, but I can say that people were nice to me, they were talking to me, they were answering my questions, and I felt that, in the end, the IT community is very much like our community of ordinary, normal people who do not have IT background. So, if you say diversity, then who can be more diverse than a woman, middle-aged, very middle-aged, grandmother from Eastern Europe without IT background to speak at the Black Hat? So that's why I'm here. Jeff, thank you for taking the risk. And I'll be happy to share some of my thoughts and ideas about nation-state perspective, and mainly about multi-stakeholder perspective to cybersecurity. And by the way, I'm a former foreign minister, which means I can say whatever I want, and I will not be responsible. I come from Estonia. By the way, I'm using slides, PowerPoints. My kids said that it's very yesterday, but I thought that maybe they will keep me more focused and illustrate what I'm going to say. So yes, guys, I know, it's very yesterday. I come from Estonia, a country that is known for Skype, but a country which is also known for NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. 
It's also known for being the first country in the world to introduce e-government, online voting, e-taxation, e-police, and they can continue. Thousands of internet services. That is part of what we call e-lifestyle. We have learned, we have enjoyed our e-lifestyle, and we also understand that it entails challenges and responsibilities. We understand that no services can completely be secure, whether online or offline. But we can and we must face these challenges and minimize the risks. In 2007, Estonia was the first country in the world to fall under politically motivated attacks against the sovereign nation. Those were DDoS attacks, they were primitive by today's standards. They did not destruct anything, they did not hurt or kill anybody, but they were humiliating and they were disturbing. They were mainly targeting our banking sector and also the so-called monumental websites like Prime Minister's Office, MOD, MFA, and so on, and so on. Our resilience was proof-tested. I was then Estonian ambassador to Russia, which means that I had two tasks. I had to learn in 15 minutes what does DDoS mean and start explaining it to the others. I managed with that. My second task was to find ways of cooperation with Russians. I failed. It takes two to tango. Unfortunately, we didn't cooperate on finding those who were behind and attribution at that point. More than 10 years have passed since then. And I, have argue, and I would argue that many things have changed, many things have improved, but there are some things that are today as important as they were in 2007. So what did we learn? We learned the importance of political decision-making. Having, cybersecu having cybersecurity high on political agenda, which means appropriate financial and human resources to the topic. We learned the importance of having house in order, laws, regulations in place. We learned, as we called it then, old nation approach. It's a policy where all our stakeholders are included into cooperation, not only governments, but also other stakeholders. Private sector, industry, academia, civil society. The collaboration between private and public sector has, in my country, been the center of our innovation. And since the early days, the government's philosophy was not to hire programmers, but to use the services of private companies, which in turn increased the competitiveness of the Estonian IT sector. And finally, we learned about the need of international cooperation. Cooperation, cooperation, cooperation. Cyber does not have borders. And that's why if you want to be efficient, you have to cooperate with others. What, have cha what has changed since 2007? Cyber attacks have become a new normality. They target states as well as companies and citizens. They have become global and massive in their scale. And they even challenge the genuine political independence, hacks against democracy. What has improved? First, and I would say, most importantly, awareness. 2004, when Estonia joined EU-NATO, nobody was talking about cybersecurity. 2018, everybody talking about cybersecurity. Cyber hygiene has been introduced to our first graders. All universities are teaching cyber in one form or another. International conferences, there are about 100 diplomatic efforts to discuss cybersecurity. Some of the questions that we tackled in 2007 remain the same. For example, the questions of attribution, countermeasures, inherent right of states for, for self-defense, responsibility of a state for the acts of non-state actors, 
applicability of international law to cyber, hackbacks, offensive capabilities, and I can continue. All these topics are today as important as they were then. From here, I'd like to talk about the role of different stakeholders in the process of cybersecurity, digital cooperation, digital stability, and start with states and governments. I would argue that states and governments have a unique role in securing cybersecurity. But for the first time in the history of mankind, states alone can't be efficient. So it's very different from what we were used to see till today. Weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons, and so on and so on and so on. Cyber is so wide that states alone can't be efficient in providing security. It's a space where private sector owns nearly all digital and physical assets and has the best IT experts. It's the sphere where civil society can produce norms, recommendations of responsible state behavior. It's a space where civil society is also the watchdog of human rights and international law. On national level, the responsibility of a state is to keep exchanges secure. State has the responsibility for ex secure exchange of data and integrity of data. State has the responsibility to introduce laws and regulations. State has the responsibility of authentication, creating enabling conditions, and thinking out of the box. Most crucial, state has to play a role in, uh, uh, in creating and preserving trust. I bring you a couple of examples from the national statements or the national positions of my government. I think they're kind of out-of-box thinking. E-residency and e-embassies. E-residency started as a startup. A couple of guys came to the government saying that they would like to increase our population up to 10 million. Our population is 1.3 million. It's one street in Cairo, it's a district in London. So their aim was to increase our population. It was a startup. Governments usually don't do startups. So needless to say how hesitant even I was as a foreign minister. I was worried about the image of my country. But those guys were so convincing. We did it. So e-residency is a program. It's not a visa, it's not a residence permit, but it gives foreigners who apply for e-residency the right to, uh, to participate in some of the internet online services we are providing to our own residents, mainly digital signature. Digital signature which, which saves five working days per year, 2% of GDP per year. Another is data embassy which allows to host critical databases in another country and allows access to databases in the case they could not be accessed from Estonia. So we concluded the bilateral agreement with Luxembourg. Why Luxembourg? Well, friendly country, well positioned geographically, and has state-owned high security data centers that have been certified at tier four level. States have to start thinking about regulating artificial intelligence. Not only self-driving cars, but artificial intelligence. Their rights, obligations, liabilities. On international level, states have to, start, states have, states have to continue cooperating globally, regionally, bilaterally. Globally, we're living in a time where the ideological division is growing bigger and bigger. Jeff mentioned that I was twice a student and expert at the UNGG meetings, and I saw it, how two understandings of the use of ICTs are taking states apart. On one side, like-minded states who see the benefits of the use of ICTs and also challenges. On the other side, states who see the use of ICTs as a way of interfering into their domestic affairs, brainwashing their citizens, coming for their sovereignty. 
And unfortunately, this ideological division still exists. So that even today in the United Nations, we have two resolutions. One proposed by the, sponsored by the United States, proposing the next GG. Another proposed by Russia, proposing the next uh, open-ended working group. I don't know how it will work, but what's important, whatever United Nations will do, it has to be inclusive. It can't be for a selected group of states. It has to be open if we want the report to be important for the whole mankind globally, then we have to inform all the countries, all the nations who are interested during the process of deliberations. And finally, if I will talk about states, there are two things that I think have changed during 2018. More precisely, the evolving state practice of attribution and discussion about offensive capabilities. As to attribution, one might argue that too little and too late has been done by states. Let me remind, the first attribution of Sony attacks 2015, attribution of DNC hacks 2016, 2017 attribution of WannaCry and attack against Ukrainian power grid. Countries did not support the United States. The United States was left alone with attribution. Breakthrough came this spring when UK attributed not Petya to Russia, and it was supported by more than states, including US, Canada, Japan, Denmark, Estonia, New Zealand, Australia, which immediately raised the question, but where is Germany? Where is France? Where is Italy? Where are others? Others meaning the EU responded in April the same year with constant conclusions on malicious cyber activities. The statement was really poor and weak. It did not name any countries. It expressed its con serious concern about the increased ability and willingness of third states and non-state actors to pursue their objectives by undertaking malicious cyber activities. That is the text of the statement. But it has to be recognized that for the first time, all EU member states collectively supported attribution by another state. And, that's an important, and that is an important step in forming state practice. Later attributions were followed by uh, additional cases. Britain and Netherlands accused Russia of sending agents with Wi-Fi antennas to The Hague to try to hack into the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. The United States indicted seven Russian agents for conspiring to hack computers and steal data to delegitimize international anti-doping organizations. And what was important about those attributions was that the first one against, the, uh, against Russians hacking into the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, it was supported collectively by all NATO member states. It was expressed in a statement by the Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg. I would like to stress two aspects. Readiness of states to op openly attribute and readiness of others to support attribution. Going back to 2007, how did we attribute? Our then defense minister answered the question, and his logic was, if somebody looks like a dog, barks like a dog, eats like a dog, then most probably it's a dog. In our case, it was a beer. It took a couple of years before we attributed more concretely. So what I see today, 11, 12 years later, states are supporting each other's attributions, and these are very strong and powerful and uh, political movements. Second, offensive capabilities. For years, it was not okay to talk about defensive, offensive capabilities. For years, it was a topic that everybody discussed in the corners, but never publicly. Australia was the first country in the world in 2016 to confirm that Australia had an offensive cyber capability to respond to serious cyber attacks support military operations, and counter offshore cyber criminals. 
In November 2017, NATO announced that NATO embraced the use of cyber weaponry in NATO operations and that NATO is ready to use the cyber capabilities of its members to deter attacks in the same way as it uses land, sea and air weaponry. I would say that it's a good thing that discussions like that are taking place. And it's very important to reiterate that whatever measures are undertaken, whatever countermeasures are taken, they have to be taken in correspondence with international law. And the important, it's important to consider necessity, specificity, proportionality and harm in case offensive capabilities are used. Of course, it raises many questions, including private hackbacks, but to have the discussion openly is better than not to have it or have it behind closed doors. As to other multi-stakeholders, cooperation with private sector, there are no golden rules. Every state and government has to find its own way. This is the logo of the Estonian Cyber Defense Unit, a voluntary military organization that came to assist government in 2007 and stayed. And they formed themselves officially a year later. People with different backgrounds, IT people, lawyers, economists, doctors, with security clearances are working free for government during their weekends and free time. Governments can never afford them, at least the Estonian government can't. They are doing it voluntarily, they are doing it out of patriotism, they are doing it for free. I don't want to say that everybody has to follow that rule. That was our, that was our way, and we were lucky to have the attacks of 2007, to reconsider and once again reconsider how to continue with our e-Estonia. First of all, governments have to overcome mistrust towards private sector and industry. Governments have to understand it's a two-way cooperation. As a foreign minister, meeting industry and private sector, I was hearing all the time that governments are not listening to us. They're not including us into the deliberations. They're not taking us seriously. And to some extent, that was true. I'll bring you examples of two uh, documents that were published and that were launched this spring. One is the Microsoft's Global Tech Accord and another is the Charter of Trust by Siemens and the supporters. They have many more supporters that on the screen at the moment. But that was a cry from the sector. Let's cooperate. We are proposing. Please take us seriously. Look at what we are proposing. Civil society has its role. Yes, I'm honored and proud to, to be the chair of the Global Commission on Stability of Cyberspace, which is one of the platforms that can contribute to international discussion today. You remember I mentioned the huge division, ideological division in the United Nations. At the time when states are not active, at the time when states are still thinking how to continue with negotiations. I think that apolitical institutions like the Global Commission can contribute to the discussion, not replace any of the interstate, any global organizations, but contribute to the discussion. So the Global Commission, I think Jeff also said, was launched in 2017 and it has a wide range of representatives from Berkeley to Beijing, from Thailand to Johannesburg. We have former politicians, we have uh, people representing academia, human rights, hackers, hackers. So we have very different people there. And in practice, I would say that it's the first time when I've seen such a multi-stakeholder model in practice and working. The discussions are tough. We've been, uh, the first norms that we, uh, that we introduced already last year was our call to protect the public core of internet and our call not to interfere into electoral systems. 
those discussions were difficult because trying to get into the same room, a lawyer, IT person, former politician, different views, different understandings. That's why the norms that you can find also on a website, they're not final documents. They are living documents. And with the public core to protect, uh, with the norm to protect the public core of internet, we developed and we looked into the first definition and after it had, it had been discussed widely by one of our commissioners, Bill Woodcock, with IT people, we rephrased it and we went much deeper with the definition. So, at the moment, we're working on six norms which mainly have to do with uh, secure supply chain, the role of states, the role of non-state actors, and we call it Singapore package. We don't want to be a norm-producing factory only. We also want to look into the future and see how should be the discussion in cyber world further structured. What are the mechanisms and principles that might be useful? And one of the norms is dealing with cyber hygiene, something I would say that connects all multi-stakeholders. Our norm on cyber hygiene says that states should enact appropriate measures, including laws and regulations, to ensure basic cyber hygiene. So after almost two years of deliberations, we have not still answered the questions. What is cyber stability? What is cyber security? What is digital stability? What is digital security? Is it open, free, accessible, affordable internet? Is it open, secure, stable, accessible, and peaceful ICT environment? Is it keeping cyberspace open, free, stable, and secure where fundamental rights and the rule of law fully apply? Or is it an ideal state where individuals, institutions, organizations, and states are confident in their ability to use cyberspace safely and securely and where the general availability and integrity of services in cyberspace is assured. Most probably, we will be discussing the last one. But again, having worked, having, uh, having worked now for almost two years, we are still in the phase. We are discussing, what are we discussing? Global commissions on cyber stability, what is the definition of cyber security, cyber stability? And I would like to draw your attention to, to, to a document. It's the Paris Call for Trust and Security in Cyberspace. It was launched a couple of weeks ago in the margins of the celebration of the 100th anniversary of the victory uh, after the First World War. It was launched by President Macron. And what makes this document special is the fact that it talks about cooperation. It talks about the need to include all stakeholders. And it's been supported by almost 400 signatories. More than 50 states, more than 100 civil society representatives, more than 200 industry and private sector representatives. I don't remember that any document about cybersecurity and trust in digital sphere has ever been so widely supported. What does it mean? It means that international community and states are ready to, to, cooper to cooperate. They are ready to the process of inclusiveness, multi-stakeholder model, multi-stakeholder initiative, whatever we like to call it. It's there. The time is ready, and I'm, I'm hearing it also from the governments. Something that I haven't heard so strongly before. So what, what, what to expect from the coming year, coming years? Globally, United Nations Secretary General launched high-level panel on digital cooperation last summer. And I'm honored to be a member of that panel. The panel is chaired by, co-chaired by Melinda Gates and Jack Marr. The panel has its objective to introduce 
recommendations about principles, mechanisms, best practices of digital cooperation. It will not cover only cybersecurity or digital security. It will look into development cooperation, awareness raising, education, trade, finances, everything. What I want from that panel, I want clarity. I want clear understanding. If we talk about inclusiveness, what does it mean? Does it mean only private sector? Does it mean also academia, civil society? I want the panel to underline the importance of applicability of international law to cyber. The less grey zones, the better for the security. The panel will end its work next year by report. Like-minded states. I'm looking at like-minded states and wishing that they will continue with their practice of attribution, supporting attribution, creating state practice. State practice might create customary law, state practice might create norms or responsible state behavior, state practice might create the rules and norms how cyberspace is and should be governed. Nobody argues today that international law applies to cyber. The question is how? And with every step of attribution, the question how has a tiny answer. I'm looking at states. It's time for states to turn from public-private partnership slogans into real working partnership. I'm looking at cyber giants who are bigger than states for their responsibility and their willingness to take responsibility and cooperate. And I'm looking at multi-stakeholders, us. Because today I feel that multi-stakeholders have the role and have the possibility to contribute to the international discussion, even between the states, more than ever before. So the initiative should, should start from the bottom. Let's look into what we are proposing. Let's consider it. Let's take it seriously. Let's support each other. And then governments will listen to us, to us much more. And finally, these are bugs. These are cyber bugs. One of them, to the right, was presented to me by my IT people when I stepped down as Estonian foreign minister, and they said that they hope that will be the only bug in my life. The bug to the left was presented to me in North uh, in, uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, when I was visiting the college there and the Citadel. They didn't say, but their thinking was the same. So if I think about multi-stakeholders, these are like bugs. Multi-stakeholders can do and should do the same, should aim at the same objectives. Only then we can make cyberspace safe, secure, accessible, free, resilient, and affordable. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, thanks. Okay, everyone, um, I just have a couple brief announcements and then we'll release you. Uh, 10.30 is the next start for the general sessions, so you've got a little bit of time. Um, the next session's at 10.30, and then by now the business hall is open across the way. And in that same business hall tonight at 5 to 6.30 is the reception. So once you figure out where the hall is, that's where it'll go uh, this evening for the reception. And then just a reminder to plant it uh, in your brain tomorrow night, the lock note session. The opposite of this will happen at 4.00. 45, where we sum everything up, we get a bunch of experts on the stage, and we have a really interesting conversation, kind of freewheeling conversation with beer, and, uh, and then we shut it down uh, tomorrow evening. So try to make the lock note if you can, and thank you very much, and I'll see you around. <laughs>